Okay, it is now recording. Awesome. So welcome everybody to Graduate Seminar. Uh, my pleasure to introduce our speaker this week from my own research group, uh, Mr. Sterling Baird, who comes to us from BYU, where he did his undergraduate in, was it chemistry or chemical engineering? Oh. Uh, physics. Am I unmuted? Yeah, you're unmuted. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. It's physics. I got Making that. Sure. Okay. Right um, he started just in the fall. So he's just finishing his first year. Well, he's in the middle of a second semester right now. And his title of his work today is called Automating Your Research Paper, Tips, Tricks, and Tools. I think this will be really useful for all grad students. So Sterling, take it away. Cool. All right, let's, uh, let's jump right in. So uh, thanks to many of you who filled out a survey that I sent out. Um, here are some of the results from that survey. So most of us, uh, it turns out, use Microsoft Word as a typesetter slash word processor. Um, we use PowerPoint for figures, Box and Google Drive for version control. Uh, a lot of us use Mendeley for reference management, Excel for tables, um, and paper notebooks for experimental data and notes. Uh, a lot of us use uh, Excel or coding language for analyzing data and Microsoft Equation Editor for typesetting equations. Now this was really useful information for me because it helped me know uh, what to start with. You know, if I do, I jump straight into the kind of more advanced topics. Um, but this gives me a really, a really good idea of kind of where everybody, uh, where most people are at. So, uh, in terms of kind of our familiarity with LaTeX, Git, and code generated figures specifically, uh, a lot of us were kind of answering, okay, not not so familiar with these. Um, so given that, I'm going to uh, first talk about kind of a semi-automated workflow. Uh, I guess you could say like a traditional workflow and then uh, go over some of the basics of Git and LaTeX. And um, I'll be doing some, uh, some of this will feel like a tutorial. Others will feel like um, more of kind of original <laughs> uh, research and uh, new, new code and things like that. So uh, let's, uh, let's dive into uh, some of this intro stuff. So what makes up a scientific document? Well, you've got figures, tables, equations, some body text, captions, and references. You might use a computing language like MATLAB or Python to produce your figures, Excel to make tables, Microsoft Word or LaTeX to write the equations, uh, generate, you know, type out body text and captions. You know, you've got this little keyboard here at the bottom, that's you. Uh, furiously typing on your uh, on your laptop or or keyboard, um, and you know we've also got software like Mendeley or Zotero, EndNote, things like that to manage references. Uh, maybe you do some version control, like saving to a box or Google Drive folder, um, and maybe you're using LaTeX uh, to take care of some of the typesetting automatically, or maybe this is also Microsoft Word for you. So hooray, you have a scientific document, but wait how many revisions will your figures go through? You finally take a closer look at your automatic bibliography and figure out it has a bunch of mistakes in it. So now you're in for a lot of manual work editing the reference info in your reference management software. And what about that one really important reference you know you came across three months ago, but just can't seem to find? And after repeated failed attempts and many hours, you start thinking maybe the paper's okay without this. And, oh, looks like you need to repross all your data for the 12th time. Uh, updating these in the tables and figures shouldn't be take too long, but don't forget to sift through the 20 pages of the, the body text to find where you reference those values uh, and specifically uh, put those in the text. If you made a mistake in your derivation, well, you might spend another five hours getting the proof to look just right again. Um, if a major section from the intro gets moved to the end now, all of your abbreviations uh, are thrown off. You know, all the definitions are at the very end. And let's say you're looking for that experimental data that you collected a year ago, and you know it's in a notebook somewhere, but it turns out Control F makes things way easier. Um, and do your hands hurt from clicking by now? Uh, so how do you cut down on all this administrative work? Um, so like I said, let's start off with a review of some of the basics, LaTeX and Git before diving into the cool stuff. So what's LaTeX? It's a document preparation system for high quality typesetting. And typesetting is what the name implies, setting text on a page or content on a page. LaTeX allows you to focus more on content rather than formatting. In plain English, the code on the left tells you that this document is an article. We have the title, the author, 
the date and our document, which consists of a title and the text, hello world. When you put this all together and compile it in LaTeX, you get something that looks pretty nice like this. And that's one of the major appeals here is uh, you give it the code, you don't have to play around with things, uh, play around with the settings as much. It takes care of a lot of that for you. LaTeX gives you flexibility, control, and automation. You can typeset journal articles, technical reports, books, and even slide presentations I found out recently. Uh, so here's a journal, journal article template, um, and here's a presentation template uh, using something that's called Beamer. If I was really cool, I'd have done this entire presentation in Beamer, but I'm still learning it and uh, figuring out uh, all the little ins and outs of that. Um, so you get a lot of control over large documents that have sectioning and cross-references, tables and figures. Uh, you can typeset complex mathematical formulas and you can automatically generate bibliographies and indexes and glossaries and things like that. Um, also, there's lots of really great software, online apps and desktop apps uh, that you can use uh, to help in the LaTeX writing process. So what is Git? It's a free and open source distributed version control system. Git's name supposedly comes from the idea that any Git or fool can use it. In other words, it's supposed to make version control easier and it also has a ton of advanced functionality. Git lets you track the state of your repositories and snapshots, which are called commits. You can work on separate lines of development, which uh, are usually called feature branches and merge these back into your main line of development or master branch when you're, you're ready and you're done with the, uh, with the updates. Uh, we also have GitHub, which is a large company that hosts software and has basic plans for free. Um, it's sticking around. Microsoft acquired it in 2018 for almost $8 billion. Um, there's a desktop GUI and a command line interface. So let's go through a basic Git slash GitHub work workflow. You'll start by initializing your repository with a readme file that describes what your repository is about and how to use it. When you create your repository, it's hosted on GitHub. Next, you'll clone your repository onto your local workspace, which generally means your computer. Then you can work on the main line of de development directly, or in this case, check out a feature branch to work on a specific aspect. Maybe there's a bug you need to address or a certain function functionality you're trying to, to add to it. This helps a lot with organization and lessens the number of bugs and half-baked content in your main branch. Once you've made some changes, you'll take a snapshot of your repository by making a commit. This is the, the version control of, of the Git version control. Uh, commits, are, commits are kind of the meat of, of the process here. While I was working on my masters, I noticed that some of my code output suddenly started looking very different. I was dealing with something around 10 to 20,000 lines of code, mostly written by myself across hundreds of files. Uh, thankfully, by checking out these snapshots, which means restoring the repository to various points in time and testing the code at those points in time. I was, I was able to track down exactly where the discrepancy was and figure out which version was correct. All I had to do then was incorporate the, the changes in the offending files and voila, I'm back on track. This also highlights the importance of writing and regularly running tests to make sure your code is doing what you think it should. I mentioned a checkout. You can navigate between branches and even to specific commits or points in time. For example, one month ago using a Git checkout. Now merging, merging will let you integrate feature branches back into your main line of development. The actual merge process is generally automated, but occasionally this requires manual intervention if the merge fails due to conflicts between the two files. You can usually avoid this, however, by committing regularly, uh, daily or every few days. A uh, push, a git push, will then push or upload your repository content to the remote repository, in this case, the one that's hosted on GitHub. Let's say you make a change on a remote repository or a different computer. Once you've made those changes and committed slash push them, you can then pull those changes back onto your local workspace. So right now, this concludes the overview of the git slash GitHub workflow. Let's take a, a look at a few of these steps in action. Uh, so here's initializing a repository. Um, you can do this in under 30 seconds. You give it a name, 
you can give it a description, uh, add a readme file and click uh, choose a license. I like to use the MIT license and create a repository. Um, that's it. That's your, uh, that's your repository. And it now has a link that you can access there, um, you know, via, via browser. Um, this one I, I just created is private though. So only I can access it at the moment and I can share that with, with who I'd like. Uh, next, you can open up GitHub Desktop and clone it to your computer. So you, uh, I hit refresh, uh, search for that repository I just made, figure out where I want to put it on my computer and hit clone. Boom, there we go. Now I have a repository hosted on GitHub and also cloned to uh, my computer. So let's make some changes here. Uh, I like to use Atom for text files. I'll go ahead and just uh, have a sentence written out here. And uh, after saving this, uh, what you'll do next in the GitHub app, you'll uh, commit these to, 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 to a branch. In this case, I'm using the main branch. Then you'll push these uh, back to GitHub. If you then take a look on GitHub, you'll notice that those changes are reflected on github.com. Uh, let's then make some changes uh, directly in, like on github.com. So I'm changing that sentence. This is an example repository to highlight pushing and pulling in Git repositories. I'll go ahead and preview the changes. Looks good, I'll commit them. And uh, now when I go uh, back to the GitHub desktop app, I'll pull these onto our computer. So we'll fetch the changes, which basically just says like, okay, what, what's there? And it says, oh, there are changes. We now pull these in. And uh, if I take a look at what changed, uh, it was that sentence that I just changed on github.com. So that uh, gives you an idea. This should be just enough for you to get started with your own repositories if you haven't used Git version control before. Now to the cool stuff. So here's a reminder of what that traditional advanced workflow looked like. Uh, we start off with the same basic components for the more automated workflow. And, and let's take a look at what that might look like. So first on the right, we have research engines and good PDF metadata, um, which will really help out with references, um, saving you a lot of the manual work involved, even if you're using a reference manager. Uh, you can consider using some conversion apps or utilities that speed up the process of converting equations, tables, and so forth. And the computing languages are great at generating figures, but what about using the, these to help with tables, equations, and even body text or captions? Finally, by keeping all your data in an accessible, trackable, and secure electronic laboratory, laboratory notebook, you can save yourself from the great hunt and reproduce reproducibility nightmares that some of you may have experienced already. Um, additionally, the right documentation can make it a lot easier to train other students. Uh, finally, we have the same version control and typesetter notes up here. So here are the two workflows side by side um, and an, where an automated workflow involves splicing and connecting new and existing tools. So let's dig into this a bit more. I'm going to mostly be showing you my personal workflow that I've been developing over uh, years, I guess you could say. Um, and this is just one example of what this could look like. So first off, let LaTeX take care of typesetting for you. It can take some time to learn, but it's well worth it, especially for any document that's more than a page or two. Overleaf is a great tool. Uh, it's online uh, and free that wraps a bunch of packages together, allows for simultaneous editing by you and collaborators, and it's built on the LaTeX language. They have great documentation that can help you learn LaTeX, regardless of whether you end up using Overleaf or not. Recently, I've also been using some desktop software called TechWords. Git and GitHub are my primary links between my files and my Overleaf document. I regularly commit, which means I get regular snapshots of my document from start to finish and can revert back to an old version at any time. Even if I share my Overleaf document and someone deletes everything, I can. I can get the whole document back at my most recently saved checkpoint. Again, this takes some time to learn. It takes some time to learn, but it's it's definitely worth the effort in my opinion. Uh, next, we have 
Science Direct and Web of Science, which are the two re research engines I recommend that you regularly interact with. By utilizing both of these engines, you're much more likely to find the types of articles you're looking for without missing anything major. In a literature review, you might start off with three to five highly relevant hand-picked core articles. Uh, then you can use reverse and forward searching for citing and cited articles in a kind of branch and bound style. Um, in a literature review session, I might read through about a thousand titles and 200 abstracts to find 10 or 20 of what I refer to as gold articles and maybe 30 to 40 bronze and silver articles. Um, and as far as what actually quantifies that, that's something that um, just kind of takes intuition and uh, you can work with an advisor or someone to figure out what, you know, what that article that really uh, addresses a key, you know, maybe it helps you overcome a, a key research challenge you're having, or it's someone who's already done what you were proposing to do. Um, some of those things uh, are really important to find. Then we've got EndNote Click. Um, used to be called Cop Copernio, and this will link with your university credentials, in this case, University of Utah, to access articles and it has excellent PDF metadata extraction. And that saves you from having to do a bunch of manual work afterwards correcting your bibliography. Once you have your article, uh, you can drag your PD PDFs into Zotero folders. Um, I recommend taking the time to make folders and subfolders and keep them really organized. Once they're loaded into Zotero, the metadata gets extracted directly from the PDF and you can copy a LaTeX citation command using uh, Control Shift C. I'll go into more of this later. I've also come across some handy conversion apps such as tablesgenerator.com, which uh, helps you convert Excel tables into LaTeX code. Um, and I've used some math-oriented OCR software, optical character recognition software, to convert images of equations and tables uh, into LaTeX code. And I've been really impressed with the results from those. There's also some LaTeX friendly plugins uh, that link with grammar, Grammarly, for example. Uh, these can be really useful if English isn't your first language or writing isn't really your strong suit. The University of Utah even gives graduate students free Grammarly Pro accounts to boot. So uh, take advantage of it. And then coding languages can also help you take care of uh, figures, table data, and even captions. So uh, we've also got Mathematica which is a great tool to quickly typeset equations and tables. And um, some things I've done is solve and output entire derivations or proofs to tech files. And uh, of course, there's some electronic laboratory notebooks uh, that you can use. Synode is one example that I'm partial to. Um, however, Lab Folder is another one that the U of U University of Utah has uh, purchased upgraded student licenses for. Uh, something that really drew me to Sino is the integration with Protocols.io, which helps you design and share reproducible experiments um, and even link your data with specific operating procedures. Additionally, for the Brave, I've been told that you can upload and I think also access the Sino data programmatically as well. So you could uh, incorporate this into a sort of cradle to grave automated, <laughs> you know, just, just have the robots do everything for you um, uh, sort of workflow. Um, Next, let's talk about managing the literature. Let's face it, we're way smarter if we tap into the knowledge of thousands of other researchers whose career is often centered on producing these scientific documents. To bring it back to the outline, this is a section I'm gonna talk about right now. As a reminder, we have research engines, metadata parsers, and reference management. The articles that pop up in Web of Science and Science Direct are high quality articles. They go through um, a set of rules and, and filtering so that whatever is popping up in these search results is um, it's high quality uh, pretty much all the time from what I've seen. Uh, that means it's, it's peer reviewed and uh, you know passes whatever metrics they use for it. So here I'm just searching for an article. Uh, here's some shameless self-promotion of the Sparks group here uh, and opening that article up with the uh, and no click uh, metadata extractor and downloading the PDF. So uh, I also consider, um, let's see, I mentioned a little bit about going through a literature review and um, I'll often go through something like a thousand titles when I'm starting a new, uh, a new research topic. 
um, bonus points if you can use tags to, uh, in addition to the folder structure, to identify specific techniques, certain topics, uh, things that are particularly particularly relevant to you. And a first iteration of this process might take me around 20 to 30 hours. Figuring out the right keywords is half the battle. Uh, once you've found, found the right articles and keywords, you can start tracking cited and citing articles backwards and forwards in time to find new articles. Once you've found the right search specifications, you can uh, set citation alerts so that you'll get notified of the latest articles that get published. And if you make an account with Science Direct, uh, you can also get recommendations of new articles uh, based on their AI algorithms. Um, I've found some uh, really, really awesome articles that have gotten sent to me in emails from those kinds of alerts. All right, so we have the PDF. We, we downloaded it using EndNote, uh, EndNote Click. And when you drag that PDF into Zotero, uh, the metadata gets extracted automatically. Um, and in almost every case I've seen, uh, when it was downloaded with NL Click, the metadata is spot on. Um, might be because they're linking with Web of Science and then embedding the metadata about authorship, title, journal info, and, and whatnot. Um, either way, it's worked better than anything else I've ever seen. Uh, SciHub is another way of downloading articles. They've had some lawsuits and website takedowns, so it's sort of a use at your own risk. And um, I found a, a pretty good workflow with, with NL Click. So here's some more shameless self, uh, shameless promotion. Um, sometimes I'll end up having a PDF and the online article open. Right now I'm, I have it open in Foxit Reader and I'm just making some annotations. We've got highlights and notes um, and things like that. So once I've, uh, once I've done that, I'll uh, go back to Zotero and uh, go ahead and extract those annotations using uh, an extension I found really useful. So it'll process for a second and then boom, there we go. We've got those same an annotations from the PDF that I made uh, saved in there. And uh, something really uh, kind of cool about this is that now as you search through, um, through something, uh, you have really granular control over what that search produces. So for example, you can say, um, search through just the title, search through all fields. Um, in this case, it was searching through uh, the notes and you can also direct those searches for specific folders, um, specific uh, Zotero group libraries um, and things like that. It's also, also has an advanced search option so you can start using Boolean operators and uh, really find, find articles a lot quicker um, if you've documented them. Uh, in a kind of uh, clear way. So those are some of the advantages of uh, over searching and you know whatever reference management software you do use, I recommend finding one that uh, allows you to uh, hit some of these points here. So next, uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, exporting and syncing references with the doc bit file and what this <clears throat> um, let's see there we go so uh, with this one uh, what's going to happen is it'll export a file and keep it synced with your library so if you add a reference uh, within seconds it's going to update that text file um, and uh, this is the output of that that particular text file that I just uh, just downloaded so you can save these to, to Box or Google, Google Drive, something like that, which gives you a direct download link. And I'll go over that a little bit more later. Um, so uh, now to talk a little bit about conversion apps. Uh, we've got the MathPix snipping tool and tables generator. Uh, and these conversion apps can ease the process of scientific document preparation for both novices and experts. So here's the MathPix snipping tool. Uh, just like the kind of default Windows one, you take a snip, but in this case, you now get your choice of, you know, MathML, LaTeX, uh, sort of whatever, whatever output you'd like uh, that it has, um, and uh, you can copy that and, and paste it as you'd like. Um, then we have a tables generator. You can literally just copy Excel data, paste it in, um, adjust. Uh, 
you know, adjust some of the borders, add a caption, a label, and it'll generate that, that LaTeX code for you. Um, moving on to some uh, LaTeX packages that I found particularly useful. <clears throat> We've got uh, book tabs, hyperref, and cleave ref, which will um, help you to create professional automated tables, essentially. Uh, so here we've got um, a file called breakdown.tech that has the table information. And uh, we've got the, uh, the output there that you can see. Uh, so here's, here's that output. Um, and you'll notice that it's taking care of uh, placement as well as numbering for me. Uh, by use, and that's uh, thanks to the cleave ref package there. So then there's typesetting math equations and handling equation references. So here we've got the equation, uh, the code for the equation. <clears throat> we have the reference in the main document. And uh, here's what that output looks like. Again, automatically numbered and uh, looks very nice. Uh, we've also got the glossaries extra package, and that makes abbreviations a piece of cake, even if sections start moving all around. <clears throat> Excuse me. So we define a new abbreviation up top here, uh, and then we make sure we're importing the right package uh, and including those abbreviations and a make glossaries com command. So here uh, we have some actual usage uh, and a description there. So we've got uh, once we've defined abbreviations here, we call those using the GLS command. In the case of machine learning, the first usage, usage of GLS will give the full form as in machine learning, right there. The next usage of GLS will give the abbreviated version as in ML. Um, and uh, you can use a capital G to specify the, that the first letter of the word is, is capitalized, GLSPL to specify that it's plural, and many, many other options. As with all the tech packages, I, I recommend looking at stackexchange.com via Google searches and looking at the packages manuals, which are generally very well documented. Uh, so here we can get a direct download link. Uh, in this case, I'm using, using Box, and that'll allow you to uh, kind of link Zotero and Overleaf in a way that anyone, any of your collaborators can update references. Um, and so person A updates a reference in, uh, in their Zotero, it updates the bib file, syncs it with box, and then you can refresh the file in Overleaf. Same thing with person B, person C. Um, you could have 10 people just flooding references in and uh, have them available within five, 10 seconds. Um, in your, in your Overleaf document. Um, so Hassan, Marianne and I, uh, Marianne's a um, high school student that we were all kind of working on a, on a lit literature review project for, and uh, we use this, so we did that. We were adding references, we were updating these in Zotero, um, and you can also uh, link to Mendeley or Zotero directly, but that doesn't allow you the same flexibility of collaboration in, in groups. Um, and uh, from what I could, everything I tried, couldn't figure out how to do it in Mendeley. That was actually one of the, the major shifts that pushed me from being a, a heavy Mendeley user for years to switching to Zotero. I just kept coming across these forums that said, well, I fixed the problem by switching to Zotero and now I'm one of those people. <laughs> um, so here, uh, yeah, we've got some of the benefits there. Uh, refreshing multiple collaborators and whatnot. Uh, we've also got citations here. So um, we can use, for example, the NatBib, NatBib package uh, to do author citations. So in this first case here, we've got <clears throat> um, a full site author command. So it'll automatically generate the uh, Wong et al. Um, and then in a, another site command, uh, the latter one, it'll just give the reference, the number there. Uh, and you can modify your preferences in Zotero so that when you do control shift C, it'll copy that site command for any of the articles that you have selected. For example, you can get something like this with uh, just a couple keystrokes within a folder. 
So now let's talk a little bit about code integrations. So we've got uh, here just kind of a, uh, the outline once again, kind of show how it fits in. And I recommend building using built-in plotting code and then wrapping these into custom functions. Is usually, that's usually my process. Um, <coughs> excuse me, most, uh, most journals will have a nine, about a nine centimeter single column figure. And then, you know, maybe something like 18 centimeters for uh, these double column figures. Um, and you'll see a lot of gridded figures, uh, sub subtile labels, things like that. So uh, in MATLAB, uh, I have some code where I'll set the LaTeX default. So I'll get LaTeX fonts um, and I'll do uh, a parity plot. So kind of predicted values versus true values if for a given model. Um, and what that'll do is it'll produce a plot uh, like the following. Uh, and uh, this is a wrapper of some, some other built-in functions. And it'll save that file uh, to um, a .fig file, which is a MATLAB figure format, and as well as a PNG, so I can uh, have some flexibility there. <clears throat> then we've also got tiled plots, um, you know, these gridded plots uh, like that. So it can look something like that. And uh, these will automatically take care of the figure labels, uh, labeling like A, B, C, D, and so forth. Um, and Setlatech is giving those uh, the nice Latech fonts there. Um, so uh, you can also generate figure and table ca captions programmatically. In the following example, um, uh, what we're doing here is essentially uh, telling it to, you know, giving it the, the description for each of each of the panels um, automatically. It's taken care of, uh, you know, A, B, and C, or if it's just two two components, A and B, um, and outputting that in a uh, out, outputting that to a file that you can just uh, sort of plop in to your main LaTeX code um, there. So now to go a little bit into Mathematica. Um, as a preface, this was my first coding languages, coding language, something like six years ago, I think. Um, and uh, I've written hundreds of Mathematica documents and, and use it really extensively. So um, you can do some simple things like typesetting math equations like you see here and outputting them in tech form or LaTeX format. So you can also do this with some pretty complex equations. Uh, so here's an example. I'll just let you guys kind of watch of me uh, generating uh, what you see at the bottom here. Um, so we're adding adding a grid, um, adding some uh, some values with units, um, doing different uh, typesetting boxes and things like that. So let this go for a little bit. Most of these are just using keystrokes, uh, like keyboard shortcuts. We'll wrap all of that into uh, a larger box. Right click and we have copy as LaTeX and that'll give you the, uh, the formatting that you see below. Um, now, alternatively, you could just write out all this code yourself. That is totally physically possible to do. All right, uh, here's a package that I wrote in Mathematica, which can be used to automatically export or format Mathematica, Mathematica expressions and proofs. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So we've got uh, these sort of key value pairs. Um, and you'll notice uh, by using this tech port function, we have, uh, it takes the equation, the file name that you want to output to and those key value pairs and produces not only uh, the equation, but uh, also a description of the variables and those, those equations automatically. Um, so here's a just a, a little snippet of a proof I did, or a derivation, I guess you could say, within Mathematica. So you open up a file for writing, and then you just start writing line by line uh, the lines of this proof. 
um, and solving it along the way. So here you can see a, one of those solve functions. It's just taking care of the, uh, the algebra, algebraic manipulation for you. And then we uh, write that particular line to the file, uh, T M V N D uh, bound derivation. Um, make sure to commit and push those changes if we're using something like Overleaf and uh, out pops up, uh, you know, whatever, whatever we've written there. So by algebraic manipulation, we obtain uh, the following. <clears throat> so I'm still learning Python and I'm gonna defer to the experts for some advanced plotting code and some amazing tutorials, uh, as well as best practices with analyzing and processing data um, and making it available to people. So um, I highly recommend checking out uh, Taylor's best practices paper and uh, Anthony's corresponding GitHub repository here. Um, and uh, I'd also like to put the challenge out there uh, to make your own Python versions of what I've, I've been showing here and send me a message or chat with me offline if you're interested in contributing to that. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, almost, uh, almost to the end here, we have uh, electronic laboratory notebooks. I'll just do a quick demo. Uh, this is also something that I uh, have uh, come across more recently, um, but just an example of what this might look like. You can uh, create procedures, uh, linking them visually and uh, having sub steps for each of those procedures and then having those compiled into uh, sort of standard operating procedure documents uh, fairly automatically for you. Um, and that's a great way to uh, help with designing and logging repeatable experiments and uh, keeping, keeping track of your data. Um, I also like to litter my training documents with five second GIFs. I find that it just um, makes it uh, a lot easier for people to follow if you can give them just a five second demonstration of whatever's going on. Uh, we also have, uh, I mentioned Grammarly Pro and, uh, you know, if you stick with Microsoft Word or uh, something like li Liber, Liber Office, um, then uh, Zotero has some extensions for those if you're interested. So question is now what? If, uh, if at the end, after this presentation, uh, you go, you nod your head and you say, okay, that's nice. And then you do nothing about it. I've completely wasted your time. Uh, I made this presentation for you guys. This is uh, um, so I, I really hope that uh, you'll take something from this and do something with it. So towards that end, uh, make a GitHub account if you don't have one and send me your username. Uh, that way I can give you access to uh, the repository that has uh, tutorials and instructions for everything that I've covered here so far. It's still a work in progress, but it's um, it's coming together and. I'd love to share that with it before I do kind of a, a public release of that. So uh, then pick one thing of what I've said to incorporate into your workflow. Uh, Taylor's recording this presentation, so uh, please go back and, and review it. Uh, then finally, if you're interested, help me develop the uh, auto paper GitHub repository, you know, with Python code or uh, delving more into Synode and protocols, the IO integrations, things like that. Um, so. That's that's it. That's automating your scientific document tips, tricks, and tools. Thank you. That was a great talk, Sterling. That was amazing. That was very, very information dense. So much stuff. I was trying to just take it all in. That was a bunch of stuff I didn't know. And I figure my I consider myself pretty savvy with this stuff. And I learned a oh, lot. Yeah. Today. Um, I'm glad to hear that. happy to open up to questions. I've got a bunch, but let's hear from the students first. Um, to that point about it being information dense, um, is there any way you could post your your slide your slide deck to? Uh, can, can we load that onto the the canvas page or anything? Because there's a lot of information I'd like to look back at that was really really useful. Oh yeah, definitely. I'm happy, more than happy to share this. I was planning on uh, uploading this to the GitHub repository, but I'd be cool with sharing it on the the seminar, like like sending it out as a something on on the seminar canvas. on the announcement maybe you could put it oh yeah in the comment i think you can put files in the attachment there but if not let okay. me know and we can distribute it yeah perfect i have a question for you have you yeah. ever do you make use of command line computing as well because that's something that i've found especially when doing with large amounts of data i found that command line computing has saved me 
probably hour, over hours of time instead of like dragging and dropping to get all the data and stuff on my computer where I want it. So if you have love, you yeah, I love that you're bringing that up. I, I did a lot with, um, with the BYU computing clusters um, and uh, getting workflows for that that are just pushing files to where they need to go automatically is amazing. I, um, with more time, that's something I think I would have liked to, to go in, but maybe um, I think I'll try to incorporate that into the, the kind of tutorials and stuff as well. So thanks for bringing that up. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. A question as well. Um, so the, how do I describe it? The, 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 like the workflow tree that you had where you had all the different softwares and modules and packages that we were using. Um, oh, oops. Um, my biggest question is how interchangeable are all those parts when you're describing that? So when you're going up from, I guess, uh, What's the best way to describe? I guess this is a two-part question. Uh, the first part is when you're learning every single step of the process, do some of them require learning the whole tree, whereas others only require picking up bits and pieces from here and there that you want to integrate? Like, is it is it very all or nothing, or can you take what you desire from it? Yeah, that's a great question. I think I think both is is really the answer. In one sense, um, there are things that I showed where you can just take the one, maybe a good example is, uh, you know, if you're not using any reference management software, mm -hmm. use something, it will help out your workflow a ton. Um, if you're not using research engines, use them, use web of science, use science direct. On the other hand, some things like, like, uh, I don't know, some of the maybe more tech heavy integrations where mm -hmm. we're outputting, we're outputting captions, we're outputting figure code, all of that. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, that essentially it's kind of inherent there, you know, you, if you're outputting LaTeX stuff, you can't really be using Microsoft Word for it. So in, mm -hmm. in that sense, there are some things where you require the linkages, but um, mm -hmm. for a lot too, I think um, you can just pick one, start integrating that into your workflow. Mm -hmm. As far as the all or nothing thing, um, I each of those things that appeared <laughs> on that tree for my personal workflow mm -hmm. are very, very specifically picked. Mm -hmm. In most cases, it's because I found, I tried other things that wouldn't do everything that I wanted it to do. It would do some mm -hmm. of the things, um, which was great, but it wouldn't do everything. And so that's where that particular workflow I picked out is, uh, okay. it's, not by, it's not by chance. It's not mm -hmm. sort of happenstance. In, in okay, okay. So uh, it, it's very much like a fine tune picking and choosing that you've done that you found to be the best combination of everything. So yeah. th there is a flexibility in terms of using other software is what it seems. Okay. Definitely, yeah. Okay. Great question. Awesome. Thank, Thank you. you. I've got a question. Uh, yeah. So with SciNote, I've never used an electronic lab notebook. I have thought about it a lot. Um, I've seen people use Jupyter notebooks. I've seen people use OneNote. Um, neither of those seemed like quite right. Um, can you talk about SciNote? How easy would it be if you were thinking of, in a data science mind frame to export that and vectorize, say, procedural, you know, process components? How is that possible to do? Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, definitely. I, um, I'll i preface with uh, ELN is electronic lab notebooks is uh, one of the things I'm less familiar with. But um, from everything I've seen, Sino is probably one of the best bets to do what you're describing to make sure were you, say, were you talking about vectorizing procedures or vectorizing data within the notebook? Well, both, sure. right? The data, both, yeah. I, I'm pretty sure it could do, but the procedures yeah. is what's interesting to me because there's a move towards vectorizing, well, doing machine learning on yeah. processing data and probably using graph networks where you connect, yeah. right? Because these things are, you do them in the sequence, right? And so yeah. that would make a lot of sense to me, but I don't know if that's something that you could foresee being possible in sign out. I, I think so, especially because of its integration with protocols.io. That's one thing that in something like three or four other electronic laboratory notebook packages I saw, uh, that was what was missing and what really kind of mm -hmm. stuck out about sign out is it had that graph linkage of procedures, but you can also drill down and add descriptions, tasks, things like that. But um, I have seen uh, them integrate, I think it was SciNote into this like smart lab setup. Uh, there's a really cool out there, really cool video out there. If you check out like smart lab, SciNote, something like that. Um, people are wearing glasses. They're like 
moving things. Uh, it's like telling them what to do and you know what chemicals to mix, stuff like that. I think it's probably one of the best bets to to do some vectorization like that of of is, the procedures rather than just just the data. Is Sinote free or is that what do you pay for it? It's free, um, and then like most of these things, oh, if you pay certainly. more, then you get more. Yeah, yeah. Sort of okay. thing. Very cool. Other questions people have for Sterling? I guess I have one more. So when you do plotting, what do you use for making your plots? Because I love Python, but matplotlib just doesn't cut it for me. I think it's like the least intuitive thing ever and has horrible documentation. So I use MATLAB for my plots, but Python for everything else. Do you? I'm just curious what you have found is the best software for plotting stuff. So the research group that I was in before this, uh, MATLAB was the main language. Um, and uh, with that, I ended up learning a ton of Mat MATLAB plotting. I'd say Mathematica is my second best plotting thing. With Mathematica, I'll end up generating some really cool visualizations in, I don't know, minutes, I'd say. With MATLAB, I found it, I'll end up tuning things a lot more um, and uh, get a pretty good, pretty good look there. I think Taylor could comment a lot more on, on using Python to uh, generate figures. Um, Python's got a steeper learning curve, but I think it's extremely, it can do everything that you want it to do. Everything that yeah. MATLAB and company can do, it can do, but it does have a steeper learning curve. I'm going to post a link on, probably on the class, I'll make an announcement. I put together recently for the Python class I'm teaching this spring, um, three videos for plotting in Python. One, just basically like, what, what are good figures? You guys heard me, so you can skip that one. You know what I think good figures are. The second one is basic plots, which might be the starters among you. And then the other one is advanced plots. And that might be where you're at, Brian, where you already know what you want it to do. You just need a little bit of help with it. And I've got some uh, on my GitHub, GitHub, actually, I have examples of how to make those figures. So if that's helpful, take a look. And any of you, if you ever want to make a figure and you're stuck on something, feel free to reach out to me. I don't know if I'll be able to help you with it, but chances are I might be able to. And if I don't, I know who, who can. Okay, thanks. I'll check that out because I found, yeah, I found MapPolib's documentation is completely useless. Yeah, so. it's garbage. Stack Exchange is where I've taught myself everything. Yeah. Stack Exchange for the win. Like I've probably in, in preparing this presentation for you guys, I've probably gone through something like two, may, like maybe 2,500 Stack Exchange questions over the last, you know, however many years to, to compile all of this, all this info. Stack Exchange is awesome. Any other final questions? I don't know when you're going to get a better tutor for a really complicated problem and he's at your disposal to answer your questions. Uh, this is more of a kind of a, I guess, well, maybe not brainstorming, but it, it is, yeah. did you find anything to use presentations beyond just PowerPoint or is most of what, because the way I saw it was that Overleaf is very much like building like uh, reports and scientific journals and mm -hmm. PDFs and stuff, but is yeah. there something you found that can, integrate over into presentations, like PowerPoint type stuff? Yeah, that's something that um, literally in just the last couple of weeks I've been digging into quite a bit more. Mm -hmm. And Beamer, I think is really the solution there. It's it's a package or a class, I guess you, you could say, it's a class in LaTeX um, designed specifically for presentations. And um, I found a few things like in the workflow that I showed, uh, you know how I had the uh, kind of two by two grid of, of plots sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, now, I actually found that it would probably be better to use a LaTeX package to add the captions A, B, C, D, and to place the individual figures because um, you'll find that in the Beamer class, uh, that will make it significantly easier to do, um, have things appear one by one. And that's just, um, you know, for each of those, uh, you know, for each of the figures that you're including, uh, it's having it stay on a on a particular slide or not is just uh, including a hyphen or not. You know, and uh, so there's a lot a lot you can do in it. And learning about that actually made me think. Oh, okay, there are some things about that that tree that I just showed that I I might um, I tweak some of the components there to to fit the the presentations as well. So I'm I'm kind of excited to to figure that out. You know, you can you can use the same code in a in an article and um, I've seen some people extract all the tables figures and whatnot and just have it feed directly into a presentation some some things like that I think there's a lot of possibility and I'm still learning so 
Okay. Awesome. Well, thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah, that's great. And uh, if you guys end up having other questions, uh, seriously, like get onto the GitHub repo, open up issues, stuff like that. Help me, help me flesh this out even more. Um, it's something that is exciting for me, and I, I'm a big fan of efficiency and automation, uh, especially when it's to to things that um, can make a huge impact, like all the projects that you guys are working on. So. Hey, well, big thanks to Sterling. Sterling, fantastic job. I will um, finish exporting this video and I'll have it posted on YouTube and I'll send the link around to people if they want to have a copy of it to refer to later on. Okay, thanks everybody. We'll see y'all next week. Thanks.